We're, uh, we are interviewing Jose Villarreal on September 14, 2019 in San Jose, California. So they have us housed in, in these cells like that um, and there's no windows in the cell and there's no windows outside of the cell so at no time can you tell if it's night or day. You don't know because the light is on forever. You go to sleep and the light's on, you wake up and the light's on. Totally disorients you. They don't want us to communicate because as social beings, uh, communication, social interaction is crucial to human beings. We have to have social interaction. If we don't, people begin to have serious mental um, illnesses and, and, and you, know, you can um, lose your mind if you don't interact with other human beings for a prolonged uh, period of time. So they understand this. They understand, um, you know, and, and so they discourage it by writing you up. If you get a write-up, you stay in solitary longer. And they dehumanize us, then the guards will, you know, um, be okay with us being in these types of environments because they won't even see us as human. Like, you know what, these people are the worst of the worst and just, you know, they um, don't see us as human beings. You know? They continue to employ um, other psychological um, blows toward you, for example, withholding your mail. You know, I remember um, the guards coming up to my door saying, um, you got a letter here from your son, but we're not going to give it to you because um, it's third party mail. Um, and we think there's um, gang messages in there. And my son was like six years old at the time, and he had wrote a letter with my father. My story in particular, I was, um, I believe I was 11 the first time I was apprehended um, by the police. And um, my story um, of how I began this um, life of criminalization, being criminalized, um, began um, um, through the school to prison pipeline. And so um, I was um, doing this graffiti. Um, an informant um, notified the school, you know, one of the students, and said, hey, um, you know, this person's doing graffiti, da da da. And so um, the next day, you know, they didn't even ask me nothing. Um, they called the police. Well, I, I was sent to juvenile hall, and this is the first time I had ever been to juvenile hall. So, of course, I was extremely nervous. You know, I'm going to juvenile hall. I don't know what's going to happen in there. There's people are just, you know, I don't know. I might not even make it out of there. I was just so... You know, I was scared. I was 12 years old. You know, I was petrified. But so I remember going in there. And then to top this off, I remember first walking into the juvenile hall, 12 years old. And when they take you into this one main room and they strip you down, strip search, before they put you new clothes and then tell you to go to your unit. And I, as soon as I walk into the room, I remember a, a, another child who looked around my age, about 12 years old, and he was crying his eyes out. So I found out that he had just went to court and they sentenced him to the boys ranch. And he was just terrified of, of that. The boys prison, absolutely. Um, we had, there it was really, um, you know, we had to work and go to school, one day go to school all day till like four. The next day we had to work, just um, hard labor work um, everywhere, usually in the hot sun. But you know, let me back up and also just note, I think it's important to note that when I was at the Wright Center at 12, that was the first time I was placed in solitary confinement. Because what they do there for us, the young kids, 
you know, you're getting write-ups or something, or you get into it with one of the counselors, they will send you to the, they called it the isolation cell, solitary confinement. And But they would do it because we're so young, they would only do it for 24 hours, but you couldn't have nothing in there. You couldn't have a book, you couldn't have a cup, you couldn't have a toothbrush. You're going in there just underwear, t-shirt, and socks, nothing else. At the age of 15, they made me a ward of the court and they sent me to uh, California Youth Authority. And, and you know, initially, um, you know, I was supposed to do, I think, like a year or something. But the California Youth Authority, um, it was a very extremely uh, violent place. You know, not only from within the youth, but also the counselors were very violent to the youth there. Because what happens in Preston, this was my real introduction to gladiator fights. This is my real um, baptism into gladiator fights. Because in Preston in the whole, what they do is they have cages. You know, literal cages with little holes in the, like a chicken wire. So what they'll do is they will hand pick black, or white, Nathaniel, uh, Sereno, you know, um, Crip Blood. They will hand pick um, rival youth and put them all into one cage. And this is what they do, the guards. Well, <laughs> I was out of the youth authority for maybe, um, maybe two months and um, I, I got arrested for um, auto theft. So, you know, I, I happened to, um, you know, be in a car that was um, stolen with some friends and, you know, um, end up getting pulled over and so they took us out of jail. I didn't have a lawyer, you know, so I just went with what they charged me with and, you know, pled not guilty. They said guilty, boom. So then um, they sent me to prison. So this was a different environment that I was entering. Of course, um, I had a lot of family members and friends who had been to prison and were in prison, so it was um, it wasn't that um, you know alien to me. But I personally had never been there, so I was a little you know nervous. I didn't know what to expect. So I get there at 18, uh, turn 19 in prison. I came back out, um, got arrested again, and this time I got arrested for um, I got into a fight with somebody. And, you know, um, in the course of the fight, I don't know, there was something there, grabbed it and just tried to subdue the individual. And they got me for um, assault with a deadly weapon. And so, you know, I ended up going back to prison and this time they gave me four years. Well, I went in at, and around 94 and then in 1996, I was sent to Pelican Bay Shoe for the first time. At that time, Pelican Bay Shoe wasn't solitary confinement. You had cellmates, you had roommates. The shoe is the security housing unit. So that's, um, you know, it's basically what they call the hole. So it's a 22 and a half hour lockdown. And then I was released out here again. I was back home again. And that time I stood out for two and a half years. And at that point, it was the longest I had ever been out. So what, what happened this time was um, I ended up, um, I ended up getting fired. And I had these bills stacking up and I was attempting to get another job. And so I had to make a very I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision on what I was going to do. Um, I had a son at the time who was just born. Either I'm going to rob or I'm going to sell drugs. So I didn't want to rob because um, I, I didn't want um, someone getting hurt. 
at me or someone else. Um, and drugs hurts people too. I didn't look at it like that at the time. I was 25 years old, and so I decided um, to do that, and, and that's what I did. And um, and I was able to stay afloat for a little bit, but of course, I ended up getting arrested and um, and sent back to prison for, for, for drugs. And in Tehachapi, I ended up having an altercation with another prisoner, and so I ended up picking up another charge, assault on a prisoner. So, um, you know, they took me out to court, and they filed new charges on me. So when that happened, um, I had been sentenced by the court previously for eight years, and um, so I ended up going to court for this new case, and they sentenced me for another eight years. So that would be it. But they said, once you finish this first eight years, then you'll start your next eight years. And so um, I ended up there in Pelican Bay, and I was there for about 10 years uh, in the shoe. So all night long, you have this fluorescent light, just bright light shining into your cell. And um, in the front of the cell has like mesh. So if you're only seeing the size of a regular apartment restroom, that's it. And then they take you, after years of that, they take you outside. You're not going to be able to see distance though, because you didn't use your eye muscles in that way for so many years. They would, they would cuff us, they would um, walk us four steps from our cell, and I was on the bottom tier, so I would go about five, six steps, and then there was another door, and you would walk into an area, an enclosed area with 50 feet walls or 40, 40 foot walls, and with gated mesh on top. There would, there would be slivers of, of light coming through, but never direct sunlight. You know, sometimes they will open your door in another prisoner, a, a, you know, rival prisoner. And, you know, sometimes people are killed. They have a, you know, they'll put a station on, um, a radio station, and, you know, they have two. One's a Christian station, and the other one would play Britney Spears all day long. So this is, you know, the music that we had to listen to. Um, I, I know, you know, it was, uh, it was, it blew my mind when I read uh, in the papers that the prisoners in um, Abu Ghraib in Iraq you know, were locked in cells and they would play heavy metal or Britney Spears because this is the music that we had to listen to. So, you know, this is a form, another form of, you know, of, um, I see it as cultural genocide, but it's another form of torture. In Pelican Bay, our culture was denied. Um, by having Aztec, so-called Aztec um, artwork, that was gang, that was, um, that was proof of gang membership, having Mexica artwork, Aztec artwork, um, they would call it gang um, artwork. So this is a direct attack on our culture. So I think that for me, getting through a decade of solitary confinement, um, I would have to, um, without a doubt, I would have to um, say that it was through my political education that I was able to have the strength and the will to withstand a decade in isolation because the way I seen the cell is I said, okay, if I apply dialectical materialism to this environment, then this is not just a cell, a torture center. It's actually a classroom. I, I you know, I didn't grow up speaking Spanish, you know, so I taught myself Spanish. I had Spanish dictionaries, Spanish grammar books, Spanish, um, workbooks. All the solitary confinement units were 80 plus percent Chicano prisoners. So what that meant was that Chicano prisoners were being tortured overwhelmingly 
in overwhelming numbers and nobody was saying nothing about it. So, um, you know, um, that's something that I began to address when I was there by writing articles and, um, and stuff like that in order to try to educate the public and particularly the activist community that I began to um, have relations with. And so this is one of the ways that I was able to get through this decade of um, torture is um, from doing things like writing. I began to write. I would write articles about isolation, about the prison, about the repression that we were facing. I began to write about culture, about art, about history, about, um, you know, everything you can think of. I began to write and get them published in these newsletters and newspapers. And, you know, I probably got over 40 articles published uh, in various publications, and as well as some of my artwork. So, my art, um, you know, I would have to say that my art reflects my political education because um, I felt it was very important learning things like what patriarchy is. You, you can see patriarchy in everything. So learning all of this and once I began to draw, I seen that my artwork was actually a weapon because women have historically been oppressed uh, in this society, in most societies. Um, I make sure and make it a point um, to reverse as much as I could um, in my writings and in my artwork and to show women at the forefront rather than men at the forefront. Also, my, my artwork, um, you know, focuses a lot on the Chicano nation and also um, prisoners. It's very important to me because coming from this environment, um, I, I, you know, I, I don't see prisoners as, you know, um, um, just um, a lump sack of potatoes like some people and being worthless to any positive contributions. I seen the growth in myself and the development in myself and I know in others as well. When they told me I was getting out, I had a calendar, I'm counting off the days, I'm like, okay, I'm about to get out. This is like, oh, this is the most beautiful moment and, and, and but that same morning, a guard came to my door, a female guard, and she said, hey, you're leaving today, huh? And I go, am I? And she goes, yeah. So you happy? And I go, well, if I walk out of here, I'll be happy, but you know, we'll see. Next thing you know, she comes about an hour or two later and says, you know what? I don't know what happened, but you're not getting out. And, and I said, really? I said, why? She goes, I don't know. You're going to have to talk to your counselor, but your counselor, this was on a Friday, I believe, but your counselor won't be until Monday. So I was like, you know, everybody, my family, everybody thought I was getting out. And, um, you know, and the biggest thing, probably um, the difficulty when that occurred was um, notifying my mother. And so she had waited all of these years for me to get released, 16 years. And so I had to make a phone call to her. And that was the worst phone call in my life. I just, I, I suspected, but keep in mind, I prepared myself. They're gonna do so, I don't know what they're gonna do, how they're gonna do it. They're not gonna let me go this easy. You know, they, um, you know, they were not very happy with me. And, and you know, I had lawyers come to Pelican Bay Prison, um, you know, because of a, an article that I wrote and they were doing some very foul things to us. They would come, they, you know, started a class action lawsuit because of my, um, you know, so the prison guards were not very happy with me at, at all. They were, so they loved this. This was, I know they were high five. They loved this. What's beautiful though is that all the other prisoners, because they knew the work that I was doing. Prisoners, whether they were black, white, Chicano, didn't matter. They all knew. They would see my articles in the, in the different publications and I would pass everything around 
Everybody knew I would write appeals for prisoners. I would do a lot of different things. So they all knew. So it wasn't a surprise to nobody in there. Like they knew they were going to do this. So when they, um, they did it, um, they ended up moving my date uh, another two months, I, I believe a month and a half or two months. They said the computers, uh, they calculated that it was an error in the computers calculating my date. So they waited to the day I was going to leave. And you know, it was a psychological blow. It was meant to get the biggest impact ever. Wait, the day he's going to leave? It was incredible getting out of solitary confinement out to the general population. That alone was like, you know, I was, they put me in a van at nighttime. That was the first time I seen the night, you know, uh, seen the stars and the moon in a decade. I remember walking on the grass of the yard and smelling the earth. I could smell the dirt. I could smell the grass. It almost smelled like, uh, like marijuana because it was so strong, the, the grass, just regular grass. But getting released from prison, I, I give the example of going to sleep today and waking up 16 years in the future. One of the things that I do out here for therapy is I participate in, um, in an Aztec dance. Music and dance is something that I've always had a, a, a passion for and, a, you know, respect for. And so coming here and um, seeing that this is my culture that has been going on for thousands of years, um, you know, and seeing the dance and the drums and the incense and all of the activities that people are engaging in this dance, um, I've seen it as um, very therapeutic. I mean, more therapeutic than you know, than meditation for me, than, um, you know, than doing anything else, you know, even to talking to other people, this was actually more therapeutic to me because it touched something inside of me that um, conversation could not. It's something that goes back thousands of years that our people have been participating in, and these are the same dances that have been going on for centuries, you know, so it's a very spiritual thing, um, and the spiritualism um, and, and cultural spirit, it, it has um, touched something in me that, um, you know, has um, allowed me to heal and uh, it, it calms me, it, um, you know, it brings out uh, emotions in me that I have not felt since I was a child. When you are placed in this solitary confinement, um, you have no movement. So you, you walk, you know, four steps forward four steps back and that's it. So um, being in this kind of um, environment where it's a lot of movement and it's, it's movement that I haven't done since I was a child and um, this as well is um, very therapeutic. And this, um, you know, it's almost like, um, it's almost going into another zone, whether we're talking about not being able to sleep, whether we're talking about not wanting to interact with other people, not wanting to be in, you know, enclosed rooms with crowds. Um, all of these things are effects of the PTSD. So what I learned by coming to Danza is um, it kind of healed what was taking place and um, the fears that I had, the, the, you know, concerns, the stress and all of the above. And what it does is it allows me to interact with others, to engage with others in a community in a closed room setting. To be able to um, feel that peace uh, when you can't feel it anywhere else is something very special. So this is why I do that. That's probably my biggest uh, form of therapy. So the radio station, the radio program, you know, I do um, a radio program called Free Aslan and it's based out of East Oakland um, at an organization called Poor Magazine and you know the radio station is um, KEXU 96.1 FM but if you're outside of Oakland online is poormagazine.org slash radio and my radio program I focus on the Chicano community and any issues pertaining to Rasa, I address them. I also have a strong emphasis on prisons 
So anything to do with the prisons, prisoners, right now they're, uh, the state is initiating gladiator style fights and bringing rival prisoners out and they're, you know, they just had a 200, over 200 uh, person melee um, in Soledad prison. So that's something that um, I focus strongly on, but of course helping others and I see that radio program as helping the community, inform the community, raise consciousness. So that's, it's, it is a form of therapy as well. So we're here uh, with Tiny and Mutiado at Poor Magazine. And you know, this is where Free Aslan's at, where I do my radio station. Mutiado also has his radio program, Voces de Migrantes. And Tiny also has her um, program as well. We're cultural workers, we're poets, we're poverty scholars. We're people who have struggled uh, with homelessness, with these false borders, with this incarceration nation, and with all the ways that this settler colonial state uh, incarcerates every poor person it gets. All of our work is informed by our ancestors, by our prayer, by our song, by our teatro, and just this year we released our own poor people textbook. How mm. about that? My son is, um, he, he's a young man now, and, you know, it, it's very difficult having been gone so long, you know, it's very difficult to um, come out and be a parent, and also um, to, you know, uh, ensure that connection um, that, that should be between a parent and a child, so that's something that, you know, that's something that I wasn't prepared for, that is very difficult. It's almost like if I was abducted, or that he was abducted. So he's gone from my life for 16 years. So that's something that, um, you know, I continue to work on, and I will, I believe I will probably continue to work on uh, the rest of my life. Some sort of disconnect, or maybe there's some issue occurring, or if he feels some issues occurring, um, we communicate and talk through it mm -hmm. for the most part, um, and just be open and honest about what's happening, um, the feelings in the moment. Um, I'm very analytical, so I'd want to figure out where it's coming from. You know, there might be a surface incident but I want to know deeper level what's going on where is this coming from and then mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. conversing it might come out that way um, it might be quick it might take a span of a few hours it might take a few days mm -hmm. um, it might be in retrospect where we can discuss it and get to a, a resolution naturally we can kind of diffuse the emotion and then get to the more intellectual logical standpoint of what's actually happening and not everything's a smooth smooth sailing mm -hmm. but um, nothing has been overly severe either so um, um, and if you look at it from a broader perspective, there's um, very serious things that can take place. There's very highly emotional and highly charged situations that could take place. Um, but we're not experiencing that. He's he's out here. He's living a free life. Um, we're happy. He's healing. I'm doing my own healing personally. And so, if you put it in perspective, we're not losing our lives. Um, we're, you know loyal to one another to what we believe um, we support each other so nothing's that emotionally charged where it needs to go into any sort of serious degree um, so we're able to kind of calm down um, after an argument or whatever could happen a flare-up whatever it is right mm -hmm. a misunderstanding mm -hmm. um, and then get on the same page to, to the youth I will say that you know um, it's important to learn from other people's um, other people's circumstances and choices um, and you know other people's um, mistakes in order to um, so that you don't have to make those mistakes.